background before becoming a union analyst was as an audio engineer for ABC Radio Networks, where I pushed buttons for nearly 20 years. And as that career began to fade, um, due to technology, technology replacing human beings, um, I elected to uh, study psychotherapy and uh, through social work and divinity, actually, at um, Columbia University and Union Theological Seminary, and began practicing and enrolled at the Jung Institute in New York, where I eventually graduated from, and have a practice now, and still keep one eye out for what might be happening in the world of media. On one hand, I think this discussion is old and tired. Everybody knows, and yet we don't know enough. Um, a couple of weeks back, an article in the New York Times in the personal tech column, texting while driving is dangerous. Did you not know that? Do people really not know that texting and driving is dangerous? <laughs> Yet, we do it. And there's an article on, here's how to stop. And that's sort of what my talk is about. I'm very, you'll know, I'm, I'm biased about this stuff. I don't hide it. I'm not a pie objectively reporting. In 1930, Jung said, the machines we have invented are now our masters. Someone who was on to this early on, a name you may be familiar with, Marshall McLuhan, whose insights into the world of technology and media were um, disregarded. He, he was writing, he began writing in the 1960s and fell out of favor, but came back. Um, and is now once again amongst the people to be listened to about the effects of technology on the psyche. His two famous, most famous phrases, one, the global village, and the other, the medium is the message. The medium is the message. And he also wrote a book called Medium is the Massage, punning on his own work. Already in 1944, McLuhan was hip to Jung, and he, uh, he um, McLuhan converted to Catholicism and um, took to it very strongly. He had friends in the church, and he wrote a Christmas letter to two of them. One became a famous media theorist in his own right, Walter Ong. He wrote to Ong and Clement McNasby and said, increasingly, I feel that Catholics must master CGU. The little self-conscious, unearned area in which we live today has nothing to do with the problems of our faith. Modern anthropology and psychology are more important for the church than St. Thomas today. That's already in 44. Jung was writing on alchemy back then. That's, that's when psychology and alchemy is coming into birth. And this was before McLuhan was writing about media. Media studies, or the philosophy of technology, got a big boost from the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, whose book called The Question Concerning Technology is still read and valued very much. At NYU, Neil Postman began the Media Ecology Department. His book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, must be at least 30 years old by now, and not at all irrelevant. Jungian analy analyst Wolfgang Igerich writes, it is our psychological job finally to own and acknowledge physics and technology as inalienable parts of our soul work. So was Carl Jung a media theorist? 
I'm going to say I think he was. In 32, he wrote, We are living undeniably in a period of the greatest restlessness, nervousness, tension, confusion, and disorientation of outlook. 1932. That's between the two world wars. And of course, in the Red Book, that began in 1913, he wrote about the spirit of this time. And this is one of the paintings in the Red Book that Angela Jaffe, his secretary and editor of his memoir, if you want to call it that, she titled this painting, Symbol of the Sacred in a Ring of Flames Floating Above the World of War and Technology. And here's the world of technology. What for Jung represents the spirit of this time? And this time is already a hundred years old. And I think it's still relevant. Progress. Attention, emphasis, which is libido or libidinal energy, libidinal, libidinal economy, has turned towards the idea of progress. Progress was not an idea all the time. People weren't so keyed in to progress in former times. Things stayed around a long while. Progress is an archetype. And Jung wrote in Modern Man in Search of a Soul, every step in material progress adds just so much force to the threat of a more stupendous catastrophe. McLuhan tells us, I think you'll find Involvement is inescapable and is universal. I'm calling this world in which we live now, at least in the first world, but it's not limited to the first world. The third world just bypassed telephone lines. And now everything is cell. I'm calling it media life world taking the idea of life world from Edmund Husserl, let's add media into that. Because what is our world? What is a world without media? We can ask. Electronic communications media create a totalizing atmosphere of transparent dependency. The communications bubble turning media from convenience to a lifeline. I think many of us have that, we, we know that experience if we neglect to bring our cell phones with us. Not everyone, but many people have a bit of a panic moment. Forgot my phone. <laughs> yeah. Right? Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, why sure? You know, there's no phone booths anymore. There's no phone booths, right? But it, it's, not, it's not, the thing is that these devices aren't just phones anymore, of course. They're, they're much, they're always on, unless we physically turn them off. And we don't use maps, right? Yeah. How am I going to know where I am? That's exactly. And that has more meaning now than ever. And this bubble presupposes two distinct and alien worlds. The, wor the world of media containment, and then those who are not in it. In the world. And playing a little bit with the idea of, with, with the word bubble, this is a picture of the boy in the bubble. There was a real youngster, this was a story, I think, in the 70s, of a fellow who uh, was born with terrible immune deficiency problems. And he would have died very quickly after being born. So he had to, first he was put in an incubator, and then a, a bubble was built with um, access could be uh, 
through, uh, access happened through holes that doctors could manipulate the boy with. But he couldn't come out of this bubble. Paul Simon wrote a song about it, The Boy in the Bubble. My contention is we're all in the bubble, or a bubble. And it's the bubble of what's called telematics. Yeah. Can you go back to the boy in the bubble? His eyes. Look at his eyes. His face. Ooh. Yeah. Sad. That's as that's as close as humans could get to. Wow. How did he die? Um. At twelve years old, I, 12. I doubt. Yeah. He died. He died at twelve. Telematics is just computer-mediated communications networking between geographically dispersed individuals and institutions. The internet, for example. And this book, The Telematic Embrace, was written by a man, uh, Roy Ascot, who writes, with the computer and brought together in the telematic embrace, which I think is the same as the global village, we can hope to glimpse the unseeable, to grasp the ineffable chaos of becoming, the secret order of disorder. I want to tell you, Roy Ascot was the teacher of Pete Townsend and Brian Eno, for example, two pioneers in the music and art world. Um, grasp the ineffable chaos of becoming the secret order of disorder. Well, one of our old-time unions, Nathan Schwartz Salant, in his more recent book, The Order and Disorder Paradox, wants to remind us that attempts at increasing order creates disorder. That's the, the shadow side of order is disorder. And I think most of us know that the more we try to control some things, just seems things get out of hand a little bit. Technological utopia, technological dystopia. Maybe a little both. A media theorist, Hermach Ertun, says that paradox of technology reveals itself at one and the same time as human power and as the power of the self-destruction of humanity. Technological utopia offers solutions to the most profound problems facing humankind. Technology is the primary so force in social change, creating new social forms to which human beings are silently and painlessly passing. And we can point to medicine. There are tremendous strides for helping people live more comfortably and less painful. And that the future of humankind is predicated upon continued growth in scientific technological knowledge and its application. The techno-optimism is uh, spoken about still quite often. I mean, Silicon Valley is very positive, but it does have a politic. It's neither liberal nor conservative, nor is it libertarian. It's techno-optimism, the belief that technology and technologists are building the future and that the rest of the world, including government, needs to catch up. It's now up to all of us together, says a venture capitalist Frank Chen, to harness this tremendous energy to benefit all of humanity. That's the, that's the governing idea of using technology to overcome technology. Let's make it a better world through technology. 
And one of the technologists, Jerome Lanier, he's begun to question <coughs> even the work he's done. He writes, the digital revolutionary still believes in most of the lovely deep ideals that energized our work so many years ago. At the core was a sweet faith in human nature. Now the technological dystopia is well described by Don Farrell, who's a Jungian analyst in Vermont. So, a philosopher. He writes, the new technology is bringing in its wake a relentless and for some irrevocable assault upon the fundamental humanity of human beings. A very clear threat to human dignity and freedom and conventional notions of being human and human relation to technique are exploded. So what do we have? We have this dichotomy between utopia and dystopia. And when, we have, when you have a dichotomy like that, you have that wonderful word that Jung likes to use, the pharmacon, the center of uh, homeopathic medicine. The poison is the cure. And I, I think that's the way to, under, to, to, to live with the technology, to understand both sides poison and a cure. So, to Jung. And the first paragraph in the collected works, volume one, paragraph one, as it was taught to me, and I think it's true, you get all of Jung in the very first paragraph of the collected works in which he writes, in that wide domain of psychopathic inferiority, we find scattered observations on certain rare states of consciousness as to whose meaning the authors are not yet agreed. <laughs> hundred and nearly 18 years later, we still don't agree. <coughs> Now, that dissertation of Jung's centered around a young woman who was a medium. That young woman turned out to be Jung's cousin, but beside that, the point was that Jung was involved in the world of mediums and spiritism. And as Sonar Shambhasani, the editor of the Red Book, and many other things, great biographer of Jung, writes, before telecommunications, the mediums were telepathic transatlantic operators, connecting party lines between the living and the dead. Okay. Now these days, mediums are seem to embody figures or entities that are individual personalities, that they are sub-personalities of the medium for self. And Shambhasani writes, the psychologization of mediumship leads to a multiple personality model. So, you know, we're, we're getting Jung, the psychiatrist, who started his work in a psychiatric hospital, working with inpatients, suffering tremendous, met some of them, many of them were suffering psychosis, which is very different from the population that Freud was working with. Freud was a nerve specialist. He focused on neuroses. Jung worked with psychosis, very different psychosis, is much more separated individuals that have a very difficult time coming together. And that multiple personality model, 
shows up in Jung's work when he talks about how all of us are a composite of sub-personalities. The difference between us and someone in a psychiatric hospital is that we can organize our various sub-personalities well enough to get through the day. I have at least two sub-personalities working almost every morning. Especially when it's cold out. <laughs> the one who says you have to get to work, and the one who says I don't want to get out of bed. And I'm sure you have cousins of mine. Um, and Jung writes, a change from one milieu to another brings about a striking alteration of personality. And on each occasion, a clearly defined character emerges that is noticeably different from the previous one. And again, I think day-to-day -day experience tells us if you've ever if you've ever been driving along and kind of not really aware of how fast you were driving and everything's fine, but all of a sudden one gets pulled over by a traffic cop, or, you know, highway cop. One's demeanor changes. I, I personally become extraordinarily polite to that person who's pulled me over. A certain personality comes out dependent upon the milieu that one is in, the, the, the arena in which one is situated at the moment, any moment. And back to Roy As Ascot for a minute. Um, he speaks about being many selves. Um, but you'll notice that he, he, doesn't, he doesn't focus on Jung, but he, he points to another source um, from where he learned about multiple personalities. He was asked in an interview in Paris in 93, do you long to be immortal? And I'd like to play his answer for you. Do you long to be immortal? I long to be many selves distributed through the networks. I long to be in many places at many times. I am many selves. It's simply a cultural construct that uh, is very much a part of our Western culture that has insisted on the unitary self. I think it was Uspensky who first, to my awareness, produced a model of a world in which many selves might coexist, as it were, within the so-called individual. So on the one hand, I think that we are made up of many selves. I think that we have the desire and insofar as I would want to talk about technology, I think this is a technology is always the product of desire. We have the desire to be many selves in many places, at many times. This is to talk about telepresence, to talk about distributed presence, about being there and there and here and there, in different places in different times, or at the same time. And that means a distribution of consciousness. And so in that sense, I long to be, I am, I want to recognize my potential, actual potential for being immortal in that sense. So here, Ascot is talking about how his one self can be distributed via network. And he's seeing each self then as having its, its own life. Because in the particular place that it will be viewed, there'll be a different atmosphere from another place where he will be seen, even if it's the, the same original recording. And he's talking, he sees his consciousness as being distributed in the network fascinating idea. So he, he, credit, he learned this through um, Peter Ospensky, who was a student of Gurdjieff, if, if that's a familiar name to you, early mystic philosopher 20th century. 
many selves. Today we we have to probably put on more selves, more versions of selves than was required in the past, and partially because we're in a mode that I think many of you know called crazy busy. A phrase that I would imagine finally got into the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, a Canadian psychotherapist, Sharon Karn, writes, since when did crazy busy become socially acceptable? You have a brain that won't stop when you need it to. A contemporary of Jung's, Jean Gebser, who never lectured at Theranos, but attended Theranos conferences at the same time as Jung was there, he writes, the terrible phrase, I have no time, is spoken far too often. Without realizing it, the person may mean, I have no life. I have no time, Gebser equates with, I have no life. And Jung writes, all the time-saving devices amongst which we must count easier means of communication and other conveniences, do not save us time, but merely cram our time so full that we have no time for anything. Hence the breathless haste, superficiality, and nervous exhaustion, with all the concomitant symptoms, craving for stimulation, impatience, irritability, vacillation, etc. This is 80 years ago. Sorry? In a much simpler world. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that was, uh, I think the essay was called The Simpler Life or something like that. Right? Return to the Simple Life. Yeah. Yeah. Compared to the Simple Life, I think he is. <laughs> right. <laughs> what was that? Well, Jung, Jung's house in Bollingen, his retreat place down the lake, um, my understanding is it had no electricity and no running water, Jung pumped the water himself. He also had pots and pans, according to Marie-Louise and von Franz, he had pots and pans that went flying around that he had to yell at and say, okay, that's enough now. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and author Tim Kreider writes, it's almost always people whose lamented busyness is purely self-imposed. They're busy because of their own ambition or drive or anxiety, because they're addicted to busyness and dread what they might have to face in its absence. Another writer wrote about the end of absence, the same, same theme, that the collective anxiety of media life world is creating the end of absence altogether. And so what is the bubble bringing? Or what is it meant? What is it actually, what are we using it for? Never mind what it was meant to do. It was meant to bring peace in the world. The original telegraph, the, the telegraph system um, built, I think, started in the 1860s. One of the early, um, not inventors, but force behind having the telegraph actually come into being was an evangelist. And he thought that the telegraph would help bring the word to other places around the world. Uh, no, excuse me. Yeah? Would you say more about what the end of absence? What yes. does that really mean? The end of, of the, the, the end of ab absence a void emptiness stillness the absence of what fill in the blank and one of I think one of the symptoms of our is that we, now you, 
Y'all live up here in the country. But we city folks don't get much silence. Now, of course, silence is also a philosophical point. But the noise, the constant noise, and I'll talk about that a little more, um, what happens with absence, or when we are in absence, we're faced with ourselves. Um, I'm sure you're aware that there's been a big uptick in people practicing various forms of meditation as an antidote. Well, it's all well and good, but as I understand it, meditation can be torturous for people. It's very hard to sit still and do nothing. So the absence of activity by itself for many people creates anxiety. And that's what the, that's what the absence is really referring to the absence of movement, the absence of action, external action. So there's less focus on internal dialogue and what's happening on the inside. The whole world's going extroverted, and theoretically 50% are introverts. And so the theory is that it's the anxiety that's contributing to the tumult. Um, maybe you yourself or you might know people who the minute they walk in their homes, turn on the TV. I do know people who, who even sleep with a TV on. <laughs> And if you ask, how come? Answers are vague. I like it or whatever. I, yeah. So here we're kind of getting into the how come. I think. It's a f absence. It's a, it's a fear of the nothing, which Martin Heidegger wrote a fair amount about the nothing. The nothing, nothings. Um, the guy who wrote a great book about the Talking Heads' fear of music album, Jonathan Lepin, in it he writes, we have nothing to fear except nothing itself, or that which masks itself as nothing, which is the ubiquitous, invisible swirling everywhere. So here's Jung on how we're amusing ourselves to death. Bread and circuses. This is the degenerative symptom of urban civilization, to which we must now add the nerve-shattering din of our technological gadgetry. There's a widespread, though not generally conscious, fear which loves noise because it stops the fear from being heard. Fear seeks noisy company to scare away the demons. Never before, says Jung, has mankind been torn into two halves, and never before was the power of absolute destruction been given to man himself. It is a godlike power that has fallen into human hands. The dignitas humani generis dignity of the human race has swollen into a truly diabolical grandeur. Are you talking about the atom bomb? Certainly partly, yeah, the atom bomb for sure. Um, the atom bomb hit Jung big. It, it stayed with him for the rest of his life. 
as it did Robert, Robert Oppenheim, who, who quoted a Vedic text or, yeah, about we now, the, the power of the gods, or th what, a thousand suns? Was that what it is? Right? The power of a thousand suns. So I didn't know there was no break. So I have to end this show and start the next one. <laughs> and here we are again. In Symbols of Transformation, <coughs> Jung asked, what is the myth I am living? And he writes, the myth of individuation. Become who you are. Now what's happening? As in the title, disindividuation, a term brought into being by Gilbert Simondon, a French philosopher. And it means the loss of one's individuality. The individual subject is considered as an effect of individuation these days, not the cause of it. Those of us who have studied Jung, we, we tend to think this individuation is a self-generated endeavor. It doesn't come from the outside. We have to, it's not like you sit around and it's like Many people today think you just have to show up and you get an A in class. It just happens because you're there without work. The sense of entitlement is growing. It, it, also in the training institute where I teach. How many absences? You're not allowed to, you, you have to show up. <laughs> mind from New School and the European Graduate School, Wolfgang Schiermacher writes, nothing is more unpardonable in this contemporary culture into which we are thrown than boredom. We save ourselves from this danger by running headlong into the spectacle. A French philosopher in 67, Guy Debord, wrote a book called Society of the Spectacle. And his contribution provided a, a, a critique of advanced capitalism, and he argues that to overcome our alienation caused by capitalism, we've let our lives become colonized by an immersive experience called the spectacle. Television is pre-internet. This spectacle has replaced social interaction and human needs. While this is superficially satisfying, it makes us isolated and lonely individuals. Hmm? <laughs> I'm liking this commentary. Sorry, it's not. Sorry it just it, it hit you really hard. What did it hit? Uh, just that that idea of we're lost in media trends versus actually living an interconnected life in a and that being something that separates us from our own inner selves. Mm -hmm. Just staring at the, like a moth staring at screens, sucked into the end of that, that, That's certainly one view of it. Yep. Please. I keep thinking of how much time uh, many of people I know spend talking about the spectacles they see. Mm -hmm. Talking about the shows, the movies, the things. And that's interesting and fine, just like reading. But yet, 
again to, to actually interact experientially, the lived experience with each other, the lived experience is what one saw on the screen or on the TV. Mm -hmm. Did you see this? Did you see this? Mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's just interesting. <coughs> the conversation, you know, strangers can meet practically and so they immediately go, oh, did you see? Mm -hmm. and, and set up it's a shared, lived experience through watching something. Mm -hmm. Now, well, two things with that. One, as a therapist, it happens very often that a, a patient will say, did you, have, have you seen so-and-so film or movie or read a certain book? And the problem with saying yes is that my experience of the film or book or whatever is maybe completely different from the other person's. So to say yes, creates almost a false idea of a, a, a meeting in that film or book or what have you. So I, I, will, I will not lie, if I've read it or seen it, I'll say yes immediately, but tell me what it meant for you. So that this idea that the person and I have had a shared experience is is sort of pushed to the side. Because what, what in, in the case you're speaking of, when someone says to you, did you see such and such film? What happens if you say no? My experience has been, they go on and on about it anyway. <laughs> That's the only thing we have to show that. Sure. 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 Say again? <laughs> because these are only cultural touchstones. In right. A lot of right. You know, if I say somebody like and something analogous to a certain kind of experience, like you know, we can use that movie that we both saw. But we, if we didn't both see it, that's my point. Exactly. Right? We don't, we don't, if that, we didn't both of, see it, there's, there's a lot of for a lot of folk they lack a common language otherwise. But what is it about that need to tell us anyway? Mm -hmm. uh, that's just a pet peeve I have with two friends of mine. <laughs> I told you this is a wounded healer's talk. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, please. Not as right. That, that too, right? Please. You know, it moves into an area that I consider fans of the spectacle. Fans of the the spectacle itself. Yeah, we're we're fans. Of, it's almost like sports. I'm a fan of this team. You're a fan of another team. I'm a fan of this writer, this director, his films, her mm -hmm. films, mm -hmm. etc. But it also then goes into the cult of celebrity, the people who are in the spectacle. You know, George Clooney, Tom Brady, fill in the black, you know, uh, Taylor Swift, okay? Um, that it becomes an unlived life. You have these people, you're collecting data on them all the time. Your phone is clicking to give you updates on what they've said, these issues, constant analysis. And you know, that's another thing. It's, it's a move two or three steps out from the, even the spectacle itself mm -hmm. that people are talking about. And they're updating. And who's got the latest data? And that's how it works lots of times as I observe. Mm -hmm. It can also be disorienting for people when someone in the community begins to talk about authentic experience. Authentic. <laughs> I mean, if you're having an authentic psychological experience, for example, you try to share that, mm -hmm. you often uh, find yourself, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, yourself. in a place <laughs> where you find yourself, right? <laughs> now, when or you people say, getting very uncomfortable with the conversation. 
When you say authentic experience, how do you mean that? I mean interior experiences that are not referenceable to the spectacle. Mm -hmm. right. And may not be referenceable to anyone else. That was partly Jung's problem. And many, many great thinkers who are ahead of their time. Sometimes that's a, that's a real suffering. I was asking because the word authentic can be questioned. But yes. You know, uh, I think, yeah, he's saying. You know, uh, yeah. Um, but w when you were speaking about being attracted to the spectacle, if you just stop there, that's enough, in a way. Not, not necessarily going to the individual personalities. Just the fact that it's, it's kind of a, a way of responding to a spectacle itself. And that, that's a point that McLuhan was trying to make. That it's, it's not the, it's not the program you're watching that's really so important. Of course, we do individually, but what's more important is the whole presentation of programming itself. There's a huge technology involved in TV that surrounds us. The effect that it has on us is large. The program itself is incidental. That's what, that's what McLuhan said. The effect that, to, to your point, Millions of people are focused on the same thing. That's an interesting phenomenon. To see uh, photos of people in some you know, village in Africa crowded around a TV set watching a soccer game. You know, it's a tremendous, tremendous thing that's happening. What is, what is the effect? You know? So here in Zurich, or there in Zurich, the school teachers of the upper part of the lake asked Jung, why is it that they're no longer able to carry out the full curriculum? The children seem unable to concentrate. And Jung told them that the fault lay with the cinema, the radio, television, the continual swish of motor cars, and the drone of planes overhead. These are all distractions. And the same distractions affect adults as well. You can't go into a hotel. It's 1955. You can't go into a hotel or a restaurant and carry on an intelligent conversation over a meal or a cup of tea because your words are drowned out by music. Worst of all is television. <laughs> the first, uh, to my knowledge, the first book written about the effects of television on children was published in England in 1955. Philosopher Rainer Schurman writes about the technical universe. It's not the only way in which a world arises from things. Other epochs, other languages, new, other worlds. The technical universe covers a forgetfulness. I'd like to play a recording of Jung that was... Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Be quiet for a minute. Um, be quiet. Um, there, was a, there was a tape in a box in the library in the Jung Center in New York. And I was working as an audio engineer way back then, and the librarian asked me to, if I could just find out what's on this tape. It turned out, the beginning of it turned out to be what I'm about to play for you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here are some greetings for you. I can't conceal the fact that I dislike the performance thoroughly, but I'm told that you like my voice better than I do. Since I am expected to behave uh, like an unselfish person, I will make the effort to speak to your imaginary presence. I have been uh, born and I lived uh, in a time where there existed nothing like artificial 
and disembodied voices, except in lunatic asylums. Now I shall submit to the demand to become one of those disconnected and abstract vocal existences, which are so certainly a most alarming symptom of our crazy present. We are all a bit disconnected from the past, uprooted from our soil and floating upon uncertain airs. That is the reason why I dislike to become one of those depersonalized voices separated from my living personal existence. It is the daily endeavor was in the last 50 years able to help people to get back to their roots, uh, to the totality of their being. Sorry about that glitch, but yeah, the only depersonalized voices were heard in the lunatic asylum before the invention of recording. Yeah. Now, that splitting of word coined by a Canadian media theorist, R. Murray Schaefer, schizophrenia. That's the effect of audio recording. Splitting sounds from their original contexts, where an event in time becomes an event in space. A musical performance gets recorded in the old days on tape or on disc, a physical thing. Even now, we have to store sound, on, let's say, on some kind of digital storage medium. So an event that one once happened live in time is now housed in space. And that's why we can have depersonalized voices in our phones. Or I mean in our in our home hi fi so The ability to record and replay sound and moving images has a profound impact on us. Yeah. And Jung does not like that idea. Along with schizophrenia, we're all Boy Scouts. We're all ready. We're prepared. In media life, everyone and everything is set up to be a mechanized consumer and the world appears to the individual as a standing reserve. Meaning the world is our oyster. The world is there to be picked. It's the, the, the psyche of our time tends to see the world out there. It's ready whenever we want it. That's my understanding of what Heidegger was talking about with his word, Bestand, standing reserve. It's at the ready. But it turns out we're, we're the ones at the ready also. How fast do you pick up your phone? Everything is ordered to, to stand by, to be immediately at hand. Indeed, to stand there just so that it may be on call for a further ordering, on call for duty. What? When did he write this? He started writing it in 1949. 49 was the first time Heidegger talked about technology. Um, I'm not sure on the date of this one right now, but I know in 49, the same year as Neumann um, wrote about the origins of the history of consciousness, and 1984 came out in 49 also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now this idea of being on call for duty, Jung writes about that in his 
Introduction to Erich Neumann's Depth Psychology and a New Ethic. Jung claims that the A, if not the chief cause of neurosis is a conflict of duty. And he also says a conflict of conscience in another place. That that's a chief cause of neurosis, a conflict of duty. Where we're caught between the sense of obligation to the outer world's call and the inescapable call of duty to oneself, which is what's so often neglected, which is why so many of us are neurotic, because we aren't paying enough attention to ourselves. We are split between duty to something external versus duty to something internal. Now, it doesn't only have to be external, internal. It can be two external things. I'd like to watch the football game. I really should visit my sick aunt. Now, there's still an I in there. I think you get what I mean. That this cause of, cause of neurosis is a conflict of duty or a conflict of conscience. And that's going to get taken into how we have been ambushed by ourselves in a way, by not understanding the effect of technology and what it can do. And that in, in Neumann's terms, in, in The Great Mother, he, he outlines positive and negative qualities of feminine and masculine. The negative pole of the elementary aspect of the archetypal feminine has been ignored. And that the negative pole of the archetypal feminine, we all know the first word in smother is mother. That's, that's the negative, the smother mother. And of course, let's not just keep that to women. Okay, let, the smothering feminine, the, the receptive, that which holds if it holds too tightly, that we would we would put a pejorative on and say that's the negative aspect of the feminine archetype. The elementary aspect of the great mother is the great container, which tends to hold fast to everything that springs from it and surrounds it like an eternal substance. The matrix, or the global village, offers complete connectivity and containment in a boundaryless and seemingly limitless world. And what that's creating is really the notion of the Superman. There are no limits. The, the Italian Yumi and Luigi Zoya writes, and guilt and growth, I think he writes very well about this, the problem of limitlessness. And of course, there was that great film, great film, the film Limitless. There was also one many years before called Lawnmower Man, which is an excellent depiction of the, the, the drive toward limitless access to knowledge. where everyone's trying to imitate a computer. Held on a short tether and beholden to till her field, a net suspends the great container's subjects in ever-ready standby. That's us. She uses her net to keep her children on standby. In that, in that audio you heard, Jung talk about our crazy present, the symptom of our crazy present, and I would call it the spirit of our crazy present, and a way to describe the condition that many of us suffer is generalized media disorder. That is not in the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual, but it was uh, coined by a friend of mine who uh, attended both New School and the European Graduate School with 
we, we went at the same time, Joan Grossman. Um, so I credit her all the time with this. Um, and one of our teachers was Greg Palmer. And he writes, basically, post-traumatic stress disorder is the condition of the modern techno-scientific world. He's making that truth. That, we, that truly we're in a state of PTSD. Jungian Harry Wilmer writes, the computer has invaded our central nervous system. Now what does that mean? For French, uh, Italian media critic, nicknamed Bifo, the introduction of pervasive technologies, the computerization of productive processes and of social communication and acts a molecular domination upon the collective nervous network. And Brian Eno even has a recording called NerveNet. And, and back to my friend Joan, the pervasive invasion of communication technologies might be characterized as a generalized media disorder, a neurosis yet to be categorized by the psychiatric profession in which we fail to perceive the body's limits, if such a thing is still relevant, let alone the limits of memory and intelligibility. Technology is penetrating us, Joan says, from the inside out, appropriating memory and imagination, nesting in the psyche, reverberating throughout the body as a presence that disembodies us. As Jung said, I don't want to be one of those abstract vocal ex existences, disembodied voice. Technology's overstimulating simulation of sense resembles a schizophrenic confusion between the visible and the invisible. Already in 2007, the APA came out with this understanding that the most insidious consequence of self-objectification, otherwise known as the selfie, is that it fragments consciousness. The selfie fragments consciousness. Now, I don't think that the, that the selfie is the only place where that happens anytime there's a mirror. But we all know how pervasive selfies are, and the suggestion is that that is having an effect on us. The selfie is having an effect, splitting us. H.G. Baines was a colleague of Jung's, one of his early translators, an Englishman. It's impossible to live in the modern world without being affected as by a contagion with a condition of the collective psyche not unlike the state of severance and dissociation found in the schizophrenic individual. And partly the reason for that, according to Sherry Turkle, the psychologist on the faculty of MIT, we are bringing technologies that were designed to provide control, that were designed for efficiency, into the area of our intimacies. So what's needed? We can educate ourselves. to do what? To be more attentive, mindful. What's crucial is education. Rule number one, according to Levy, locate the off switch. <laughs> now the funny thing is a lot of our devices don't have one. We have standby. Our TVs are never off totally because it would take much too long to warm up. Those, those of us who are old enough to remember, you could 
turn your TV on and go make a cup of coffee and then come back and it would be ready to view. And then came standby. So you, the electric bills went up. So rule number one, locate the off switch. Um, There's this thing called the Red Book that I've mentioned it before. I don't know if, if is that general consensus? Is everyone familiar with what the Red Book is? I imagine by now it's 10 years. Great. Okay. Well, before there was a Red Book, there were seven black books. They're now be not only translated, they're going to be published next year. And, and one would say, why would they do that? Because they're quite different, actually. The Red Book was edited three times, or three or four times before it was finished as much as it could be by you. He never finished it completely. But in the, in the Black Books, didn't make it to the Red Book, our time requires something capable of regulating the mind. More than ever, we require the living truth of the life of the mind, something capable of providing firm guidance. because our time seems to be stolen from us very often. Where does your time go? asks media theorist Siegfried Zielinski. We should not pay so much attention to how much or how little time we have. Rather, we should take heed of who or what has the power of disposal over our time and the time of others, and in what way. John kabat who's written a heck of a lot about mind, body, and trying to find peace through sitting. It is indeed a radical act of love just to sit down and be quiet for a time by yourself. Christopher Whitman, a New York analyst who was charged by Jung to bring alchemy to the United States, is my understanding. Um, he was asked, should everyone go into therapy? No, he said. Not all problems need or can be solved. We could also just sit down. When you can't solve your problem, the question is, really, can you sit down? But he goes further on to ask, if, when you, if you do sit down, when you sit down, do you feel like you're sitting on a, on a meadow, or do you feel like you're sitting on thumbtacks? Peter Kingsley, whose recent book, Catafalque, I think for people interested in Jung, is pretty much a must read. Peter Kingsley, Catafalque. Um, a catafalque is a, a, a funeral beer. It's, the, it, it's not the casket itself, but it's that which people would carry the casket on. And um, so the title is Catafalque, and the subtitle is Carl Jung and the End of Humanity. And, uh, it's two volumes. Each is about 400 pages. Volume two is the footnotes to volume one. <laughs> he backs up his bullshit, as I like to say about myself. You gotta back up your bullshit? He does. He really does. Um, the real task for us now, he says, at this particular point in Western civilization, is to stop and pause. But that stopping and pausing, as I mentioned before, is that a reset or is it torture? Is it torture to stop? Are you sitting on thumbtacks? What's happening? 
Uh, so, uh, Brian Eno and a colleague Carl Hyde uh, put together a song called Slow Down, Sit Down and Breathe, a part of which I'm going to play. Slow down, sit down and breathe. Look at nothing in particular. Everything talks to you. dropping out anymore. <laughs> yeah, for those who know, turn on, tune in, drop out. To be, just be, is important, reminds Nizagadara Maharaj, one of the often quoted uh, contemporary Hindu thinkers. It means that for the time being, you're free from the obsession of what next? What next? Be free from that. It would be a nice idea if you just sit down. Now the thing is, as Jung writes, no one can claim to be immune to the spirit of his own epoch. We are all, without exception, insofar as we are particles in the mass, gnawed at, and undermined by the spirit that runs through the masses. Our freedom extends only as far as our consciousness reaches. Beyond that, we succumb to the unconscious influences of the environment. We're the only beings that we know of who are capable of developing possibility of dealing with our impulses. We're not just operating on instinct. We do have the possibility to bring consciousness to what we do. We can question. The, the worst, most terrifying question an analyst that I worked with for many years would ask me I do a lot of stupid shit things. He would say, why would you do that? <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> what a really great question. <coughs> why would you do that? Why would you spend, why did I spend two hours on YouTube the other night? I mean, I know why, and I don't really know why. Honestly, I like the music. I mean, I'm a, my, my YouTubes are, my, my YouTube addiction centers around music. Oh man, if I don't set a timer, I'm gone. I can't bring consciousness to it. It's too, it's too much libido, overwhelming libido, interest. If you have not had the opportunity on YouTube to watch Jung videos, and maybe you do this in, in your group, there's an interview uh, done by the BBC called Face to Face with C.G. Jung. Good watch. Uh, I'd like to play a little part from it. And this leads me to the last question that I want to ask you. As the world becomes more technically efficient, it seems increasingly necessary for people to behave communally and collectively. Now, do you think it possible that the highest development of man may be to submerge his own individuality in a kind of collective consciousness? That's hardly possible. I think there will be a uh, a reaction. A reaction will set in against uh, this 
uh, communal uh, uh, dissociation. You know, man doesn't stand forever his nullification. Once there will be uh, a reaction, and uh, I see, I see it setting in. You know, uh, when I think of my patients, they all seek their own existence and to assure their existence against that complete atomization into nothingness or into meaninglessness. Man cannot stand a meaningless life. How much meaning can you get back to this gentleman's comment about getting updates on one's favorite celebrity? How, how much meaning are we going to actually, personal meaning, can one cultivate from that? It, it, I, I, it just seems problematic to me, ultimately. But I like the fact that already in 50, 59, Jung was a bit optimistic. He thinks we, we, we will, we, sort of like um, when one faces one's own demons and says, basically, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and does something to change. I think Jung is, he, he's got some optimism that we will, we, we will, can, learn how to deal with our technological world. We're just kind of in, in a way, in, in infancy stage. That perhaps as we grow more aware and more fluid in a way with our tech, we can choose to have our own space along with it. I mean, we're certainly not going to get rid of technology. It's not, it's not, it's not going to happen. But I do think Michael Levy is right. We need to cultivate a better understanding of how we sit in relation to technology. We need to, as Martin Heidegger said, we need to understand that technology enframes us. It sets up a framework in which we have to operate. We all know what it's, the, the misery of a software upgrade. <laughs> you know, and I'm not talking about the misery of when Apple decides that in this upgrade, any, 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 anything you've done in the past, any videos you've had in the past, too bad it can't play on the new system. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm just talking about learning the different icon, or, or whatever it is, we, we, yeah, we have to learn how to, how to modulate our feelings around. Um, any, I've talked for an hour and a half. Yeah. Two things that have bothered me about this, I was, thank you for a very thoughtful presentation on this dilemma that we're in. But you know, one thing that occurs to me is how commercially driven the whole operation is. And that's something they don't like to put out there in your face, but you know, my smartphone is being invaded. You know, by, by both advertisements and people trying to manipulate me with false urgent warnings about this and that and entrap me financially. Um, so, you know, it's all perpetrating something that really, I can't go on my computer anymore without having competing uh, explorers and drives to, to tempt me to buy in and get this package or you have this many problems with your computer. And I have to wade through all that now to go where I wanted to go where initially it was I could plug in and would come up and I could work with it. And the New York Times had a very startling and insightful uh, research article about a month ago. I didn't take all the details down, but what is happening to children who are preschool 
in the earliest phase of development who are being exposed to this. And what is happening is a reduction in their cognitive function, a reduction in their ability to read, and over time, what I see as a professor is a reduction in social skills. So it's stripping people of some of the fundamental things that enrich and deepen your life. If you want intelligent feedback about things, you cited two dozen authors who'd be worth looking at. To me, to be able to read a book and to have someone talk to you respectfully about their ideas, and I can accept or reject them is a stimulating intellectual endeavor. A lot of the media is flashing, it's colorful, it's quick moving. It's like commercials that you know are rapping, basically. And the thing is, for young kids, it's setting them back in life, like you were talking about that premature child who was so challenged and is now being more disabled. So they had a study. This is coming out now. They're looking at this. And they're finding very bad things. It's a dark you know, universe, we're spinning people out in you know, very early stage to put this machinery in their hands. And, it, and it's also doing it to other people, you know, to, you know, people in various age groups in different ways. I mean, the social skills are eroding because, you know, I take a break in a class and nobody talks to each other, they all pull out their phone. <laughs> I force them to interact. I teach leadership and group dynamics. And you know something? It has a healing effect. And they said, you know, it helped me in my family. Well, it's meant to, you know, because you're in a group. It's a family. Um, but the thing is, you know, there's erosion of a lot of basic human skills, and the cognitive and the reads seem to be critical. So anyway, that was something I encountered, and I'm getting to be more and more disaffected by all of this. You don't look disaffected right now. <laughs> I meant it just, well, you know, you have to take a counterpoint and skin, so does Jung, you know? I, I like it, Jung could be aggressive with these issues. And it's interesting when you do see him on film. But, but you know, this gives me a forum to at least discuss it with some people who are exploring it and thinking about it at a deeper level, because a lot of people are just so inundated with it and adapted to it they've lost perspective to question. I mean, ultimately, you're concluding with, we need to step back, question, and carve a space for our inner life and our individuality, you know, and not be ruled by all this and the pressures of it. Thank you for stimulating the presentation. I would love it, actually. Couldn't a lot of these things be said of the printing press and the newspaper and when the, you know... Not to the degree. ...media were bringing stories from across the world and people were gathering and telling stories to read them and aren't, isn't there a degree to which we're ultimately talking about a lot, of, a lot of the disruptions that took place back in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries when people started moving around with those, whatever the traditional cultures were, were lost and they were replaced by something. America was founded post printing press. Mm -hmm. People were looking to books, they were looking to media, and you know, newspapers were media at the time. And it was traveling the globe after the spice trade, uh, bringing tales, the exoticism, the ideas of what an ideal republic should be. And people were always judged in advance by what this new self should be, what this new life itself should be. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to you know, undermine too far because I think there is a categorical difference. Uh, but when I, when I taught at UMass, I asked my students um, this question that I've always loved, which is, have we changed what it is to be human? And one of my smart, older students um, said, I don't think we've changed what it is, but I don't think we're in touch with it anymore. Mm -hmm. Cool, right? So I think that it, it becomes really pregnant to figure out what our what the relationship is right. uh, with this genuine self and where we, did we ever go someplace to know that genuine self or is that self? Now it's just a future project. I mean, the picture you're painting is devastating for our culture, right? Well, you know, somebody holds the one side, and hopefully there'll be another. Yeah. Um, I, I, I simply think the, the ubiquity of it, the inescapability of it, um, 
my heart goes out to people who who just are not computer savvy or have computers at all. It's difficult to get a lot of things in the world now. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not computer illiterate, but the U.S. government, in trying to, for me to um, re-up, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, renew, thank you, my global entry um, <laughs> to get to get in so I don't have to stay online for three hours at customs. Um, took a half an hour because it was so unclear. And I, my, my, I, I just, I think that's different now. I know people have always, it's, it's always tough, but it's the, it's the, it's the bubble of it. There was, my, there, you didn't have to read the, the posting, the, the newspaper on the wall, if you didn't want to, and you could survive. But I think today the requirements it's almost like cash in some places. You can't use cash at a place called Dig In, a chain, a food, a food dispenser place. Um, no cash. It's interesting. That's a different world. I, but I get your point. It's just, to me, it's the ubiquity and the inescapability of it, as, as McLuhan said, that makes it so different. But you're right, every technology changes, has an influence in consciousness. It's just this one, plus the, the economic factors that are driving it, seem to be somewhat different. Is that fair? You know, if I could just actually piggyback on the economic aspects, I don't think we can overlook entirely the degree to which, I'm not, not exaggerating, there are right now teams of experts meeting in skyscrapers in Silicon Valley, strategizing how to commoditize hormonal releases with notifications and beeps and buttons and, and signals. So this isn't something where it's just technology is doing it. There are teams of computer scientists who are designing this in order to commoditize. Right. Okay, so it's being foisted on us. It's not just something else. Right. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, like I said, I don't want to go too far. No, no. sure. I appreciate it. But I think that a lot of these things are, are, are old. Our old. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that, I mean, human beings, we have all kinds of dark sides of criminality and everything. But it seems to me it's put me in touch with global criminality. Um, you know, uh, I, in one day I was try someone, a global, tried to scam me, you no, know, over a period of a week, with my husband and I counted three times a day from some country over there. You know, and I know, but the criminality that's coming through, <laughs> Uh, and sneaking up on you, you have to be on guard. It, um, my the sanctuary of my home is now penetrated, and I know the sanctuary of my mind is being penetrated. You know when I'm watching this stuff, and I know they're working on. Uh, penetrating the sanctuary of my mind and tricking me for political reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think there, there are huge problems coming up. And a, a long time ago, when I was doing research, uh, I started doing some stuff that they said couldn't be done, because I'm, I'm an intuitive, and I could understand some of it more of the unconscious a group, so, so we can't research the unconscious. And I said, mm, well, mm. but I decided we, we weren't ethically mature enough, so I stopped doing the research. And it, but it always brought with me the wish or the 
concern really about whatever we do, the ethics, the morality, the humanity, I mean the basic problem of being a human being. You know, what is honor? What is empathy? What is honesty? The values we hold. So whatever tool we make is going to cause problems, but I'm concerned about, it feels to me like an enormous loss of values. And then protecting myself from being penetrated by a society that doesn't hold the values I hold. So, it's scary. Yeah, I, I uh, want to compliment you on the visuals. Yeah. <laughs> this has to be the best lecture I've ever heard with what you were saying and the visuals were, were so powerful. And, but my question was, uh, or comment was about Martin Heidegger, is um, the last few years I've just been, I don't know why, I, I, have, I must have about 15 books on Heidegger and I've just been reading his, the le later Heidegger, which you mentioned is his, uh, deep thinking uh, of technology. And, and uh, he was also, he, he, started, he started studying the works of the poet uh, Hodelin, the German poet uh, who was uh, friends of Hegel and, and uh, you know, and, and he had a quote from Hodelin, uh, in this earth, no, po poetically in this earth man dwells. And I, and I looked at that statement and what he meant was poetically, through the unconscious or through art, man dwells close to the earth. And, and Heidegger, Heidegger always wrote letters, he refused to type. He said it's his personal communication wanted to come through the hand. Also Heidegger reminds me of Jung, he, he built a, a hut in the early 20s in the countryside in Germany, it's still there now, it's a museum. And that's where he wrote his, his most famous work in 1927, uh, Being in Time. And he, ha he kept it his whole life. It had no electricity, no running water. And, um, they hated each other. and, and he, said, he said some of his writings, he, he had an interview with the, the Spiegel in 67 and was published after he died in 76, saying uh, only another god can save us. And when, when the man went to the moon, everybody was joyous of, the, of technology. He was really sad because he said, we're going further away from our inner core. He wasn't against technology. He was, and my last, my question is, I'm getting into the question, is from my reading of Heidegger, it's the metaphysics behind the technology. In other words, man looks at a forest. We can exploit the forest, cut down the trees, and it's a, it's a reserve to exploit. And now with the gl global uh, climate change and we're just looking at the natural world, like all the, all the insects, all the birds are gonna die within 80 years. I mean, all the living forms, because <laughs> we're destroying the habitat. So I, I it's, it's, not, it's technology can save us, but it's the way we look at technology. It's the metaphysics. Can you explain a little bit of that, or is that too long and winded of a question? <laughs> Just, his, his, his Heidegger's point is, as I understand it, is to understand that technology frames us. He called it the gestell. Right. The, and, and from where we get in, in psychology, gestalt therapy, which talks about the, the, the environment in a way, and, and the, the various actions that one does and so on. How uh, technology enframes us, that's the word. It, it, it puts something around us that Heidegger was suggesting we learn about. Mm -hmm. so that, that's the okay. um, Yeah, sure. Let's yeah, sure. make a quick comment. This is such a huge subject. Right. I mean, boring too. But something that, that I've been thinking about that you sort of covered in this um, is the idea that in the digital world, in this world that we're creating, this virtual world that we're creating, some of the diseases of the mind are being externalized. Mm -hmm. I have read about a virtual reality idea where you could put on glasses and walk into a room and there will be real things in the room and the room will, will also contain other things that are virtual or 
or generated that come into the room. So you would have an experience where you'd walk into a room and maybe there's a unicorn that's going to walk through the door or something else, and that mixes reality. And this is a thing. This is being worked on. Now, is that not just a psychosis? You're in a situation where you can't tell what's real and what isn't. So we're almost artificially generating for ourselves these, these states. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's potentially... You know, with, with particularly with the collectivism that can happen, uh, the pre, the preamble to a war, for example, mm -hmm. these things can really be dangerous to us. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I like the way in your presentation that you, I feel like that, that was depicted when you started yeah. doing this fragment that you yeah. were breaking. Mm -hmm. It was quite effective. Well the done, by the way. Very effective. Technology can be a friend. Yeah. <laughs> Please. There's a, uh, an album by Roger Waters called The Peace Death. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Please. All right. Yeah, I want to thank you on putting together such a comprehensive presentation on uh, the current state of media and how it relates to the unraveling of the American fabric. You know, I think it's really relative, and I mean, this was excellent. You know, times have always been uncertain since the Egyptian sacked the Babylonians and, you know, <laughs> you know, the invention of the print and press. You know, we have these curves. But the difference here, you know, when the radio came out, it was the devil's tool. The musician union banded together. Uh, the churches wanted to get rid of it. But everybody's got a radio now. But the difference here is the exponential rate that things are moving at with technology and the media. And the, the invasiveness is it's becoming more and more, and we're getting this fragmentation. You know, and young, I'm being crazy busy. You know, it's like it says, he said, when you get to the point of being sick and tired, of being sick and tired, yeah. Jung offers hope and optimism. You know, and I, I think that's a beautiful thing. So I'm really glad that I was able to be here, you know, and that the last thing I wanted to say is, when you were talking about the end of absence, you know, Carol had a question, uh, you know, what does that mean? And I was thinking about the end of absence. And as we move through time, recorded history, the space that existed out in the meadow, so to speak, is being filled in more and more, I mean, in the city life. But not just from the meadow to the city, across the board and in different realms on different levels. More and more, space is being filled and there's less and less time. It's like when we listen to music, there's a note and the interval in between and then another note. And sometimes it's the interval that's just as important as the note. And our society is getting more saturated and dense. And these are all great things to think about. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I thank you. Yeah. Yeah.